So there's no absolute or universal definition of low code. So we'll kind of look at the space around and define what these terms mean to us kind of in this presentation. And I think it's useful to treat this as a scale from no code to pro code, because that's really what this is. Uh, different solutions and approaches are more or less no, no code, more or less low code or more or less pro code. So it's never an absolute. So we're, we'll start by defining the extremes here. Uh, so let's take a look at no code. Uh, first, the obvious thing, the amount of code someone writes when developing an application using a no code tool is zero. Uh, this has a number of benefits, such as less low level bugs, maybe in the logic and so on. Uh, but for this to work, the building blocks you use to piece together an application needs to be kind of quite big and kind of UI and logic built in and so on. Uh, this means that basically anyone can create applications and it's, it's much faster to do than coding everything from scratch, at least to a point, because inherently these ready-made building blocks are kind of limited to what somebody already thought of making. Uh, and once you hit some limit and kind of find a need to customize the functionality, things can get pretty hairy. So trying to implement logic without code is certainly possible, but it's no less complicated. You have to create the same logic. Uh, once the problem is a bit more complex, you end up needing specialized so-called no-code developers. And sometimes you kind of wonder if the thing you're avoiding now at this point is typing. So it's more like a no typing solution. Uh, it's a different way of representing logic uh, than what you'd have in code, but kind of the same logic. It turns out that these no code developers can be even more hard to find than regular developers as well. Um, also, Code is a precise and quite efficient way to express logic and the tools available to us regular developers are, are quite robust. Uh, one other drawback is that you rely on the platform vendor for performance and reliability. So usually there is no feasible way to move off the platform without kind of doing a whole rewrite. A few years back, there was a lot of hype about, around these kind of general purpose no code uh, tools, and there are a few such solutions still, but today most of those solutions have either moved towards low code on the scale that we had, or turned into kind of much more specialized and focused solutions where you build a specific type of application. So the aim is to be able to create an application that addresses some specific need your company has without any code. So as an example, Webflow for your website or Airtable to create application-like things on a spreadsheet, uh, Coda to create application-like things in a document, and so on. Uh, so these are very specialized, specific things you can create, and, and they are a powerful solution, but not really general purpose to build anything. Okay, so if that's no code, uh, what on earth is pro code then, the other extreme? So, well, as you guessed, this is just kind of normal coding with a general purpose language, plain Java code, business as usual. The term pro code is mostly used in these cases when kind of talking about no code and low code and kind of to specifically contrast against those. Uh, you can also think of it as professional code or being for code, pro code, not against. Uh, so for us, this also, uh, it's, it's kind of to contrast the quality of the code produced. So in the end, all these solutions produce code that is running the application. Uh, and one of the complaints that low code solutions often get, or no code solutions, when you get to see the code generated, it's, it's a mess and not the type of code a professional developer wants to work with. So it's not pro code. Uh, we develop pro code in editors and IDEs, such as IntelliJ, VS Code, Eclipse, and, and so on. The tools, uh, especially for typed languages, such as Java and TypeScript, 
are very good and help developers a lot. We are not just typing characters. We have autocomplete and AI to speed things up and generate kind of whole blocks of code. Uh, the tooling around versioning and collaboration are also very good, very robust, and allows whole teams to work on the same application at once. And this versioning and teamwork is also one of the major challenges with no-code solutions. Uh, so what about low-code then, our main topic? So it's pretty clear now that it kind of sits between no-code and pro-code. Uh, it has a bit of both. The trick is to kind of try to get the best of both worlds. Uh, but that's not always what we think when we hear low code. And because this is sort of a mix of everything, the category is kind of the one that has the most loose definition. So we see a lot of variation here, what, what people intend when they say low code. Uh, one definition that you might think of is the one from Gartner. So when analysts talk about something, they need a pretty precise and, and, and solid definition. And for Gartner, they have this magic quadrant called Enterprise Low-Code Application Platforms, or LCAP. It's important to note that this is not just low-code. They're not just saying low-code. It's a more specific definition. Uh, they define a platform like this to include low-code and no-code capabilities, mix in a bit of rapid application development and a big part of this is that you can easily deploy applications from the platform and run them and so on. Uh, I think this is kind of what many of us think of when, when we say low code, but it's actually kind of a low code platform. Uh, and some typical examples are Mendix, OutSystems, Power Apps, and Retool. Many of these low code platforms have a history that started in business process management or something similar. Uh, Often the example use cases, they have had this kind of similar flavor kind of as the roots of the platform. Um, they might have been talking about no code previously, but now uh, the idea is you do something without touching the code and then you kind of sprinkle in some code to make it more flexible. So the platforms largely have kind of the same pros and cons as no code, but to a lesser extent, if you will. Uh, so, for instance, some LCAP platforms offer a way to eject or export the whole application and to get the code for everything uh, to kind of minimize the feeling that you're locked in. The problem with this is that there's a lot of glue code and custom code added by the platform that is not really a documented framework. It's not framework code. It's not kind of, it, it's something undocumented. So it's not really pro code. Uh, it's really hard to tell beforehand if, if kind of ejecting is a feasible course of action or if you essentially end up rewriting the whole thing. Uh, but if we look at low code more generally, not just strictly the LCAP definition, there's a lot of good ideas and potentials. Uh, and that kind of gets us to our take on low code. Uh, so let's switch gears and take a look at how we think at low code or think about low code at Vardin, what we mean when we're talking about low code tools. Um, and notice I'm not saying kind of a low code platform. I'm, I'm talking about low code tools or, or just low code. I've been jokingly referring to this as love code, as in we love code also. Uh, because it's not about less code, it's about writing the code that matters. Uh, because we think code is essential to create good applications. Uh, but we want developers to be able to focus on the code that makes a different difference. Uh, so we want to kind of minimize these kind of repetitive, boring coding tasks and minimize toil. Uh, and make low-code tooling for tasks that are not efficient efficient to do kind of by typing in an editor. So uh, that involves kind of creating more and bigger building blocks for reuse, uh, generating pro code when possible, and kind of to realize that visual tasks are often best done visually. Um, 
let's look at some practical examples of what, what I'm talking about. So one type of low code we believe in is just basically bigger prefabricated building blocks that you can use as is or extend a bit to suit your use case. So don't spend a lot of time custom crafting functionality that does not differentiate your product. This is basically the reason we have frameworks in the first place. So it's kind of at the core of what Vardin does. Uh, but even kind of on a higher level, in most business and enterprise applications, there's a lot of things that just need to be built, but they are not unique to this application in any way. So think authentication, user and permission management, sending emails and notifications, and the list goes on. Uh, mostly these kind of back office and, and things you just need to take care of. Uh, and these are kind of essentially the same in every application. Uh, there is a webinar called Build Apps with Less Code Using Pluggable Modules on this topic from February this year. And it's available on our YouTube channel. So take a look at that if you want a little bit more detail about how we think uh, this might work. Uh, then some things that speed up work in other ways. Uh, when running a Vardin application in dev mode, the component locator allows you to click on a component in the UI and find its code. Um, this is super useful, but not exactly low code on its own. own. Uh, but it unlocks something quite powerful as we are able to find the code that's representing or kind of it's creating that piece of the UI. We can also modify that code. So modify an application that's running in dev mode. So this will allow for some interesting things in the future. Uh, a more visual example is our team editor that allows you to change CSS without coding CSS, basically. And you can see the changes live. Um, styling and CSS is one of those things that are visual. And if you are not a CSS guru, using a tool that writes this code for you or kind of shows you how to how you can, can write that code and what, what it looks like when you adjust the thing can be very powerful. Uh, we'll see a demo of this in action in a few minutes so you can see how that currently looks and works. And we saw that most of you are familiar with Start uh, which has been the main way to start a Vardin project for, for a while. Uh, you've been able to add views from a number of different templates and configure a bunch of things before you download. But recently we have added the ability to visually edit and create complete new views. And you'll see a demo of this in a minute as well. Uh, we've also added sharing, uh, which brings me to a point about low code that we also think about. So we want to make it easier to involve other stakeholders in the project, uh, but as much as possible do this so you don't have to kind of re-implement the same thing for different purposes. Uh, so a product manager might create a general flow for a new part of the application without coding, uh, get it approved or show it to customers or stakeholders, and then just let the developers take over and, and add the business logic without kind of re-implementing things and, and kind of having that sort of handover. Uh, so this is kind of what we are currently working on with start Vardin.com. Let's see if I can get all those boxes to show up. Uh, and the ability to share. Mm. So some other things we are exploring and experimenting with at the moment. Uh, we can use AI to aid a bunch of things. So for instance, turning a screenshot of a le legacy application into a new UI that you can edit. Uh, or if designers use our design system in Figma, those components can be mapped to real pro code 
components, so our real components. And we're exploring kind of ways to help developers leverage that so they can kind of go from a design to code in a more seamless way. Uh, Startwarding.com already has a simple data model editor, but it's a bit hidden and limited. So uh, expanding on that, for instance, making it easy to create UIs for existing data sources is something we are looking into. And not everything is in place yet, of course. And there are challenges to solve, especially around kind of going back and forth between low code and pro code and so on. But we are going to continue to create and improve these low code tools and always keeping the developer and developer workflows in mind and kind of ensuring that you get pro code as the end result. Uh, tools that can be used for as much or as little as you want. So there are individual things you can use. Uh, tools that speed up kind of specific tasks that are not efficient or not fun to do by typing. Uh, tools that enable seamless teamwork and kind of minimize the need for handover and re-implementation as, as much as possible. So tools that allow everyone to develop, develop better applications for work is kind of the goal. And this brings us, I think, to uh, what I assume we've all been waiting for, demo time. Okay, thank you, Mark. Okay. I hope everyone's in my screen. I will start from the page that I hope most of you know, the start of Adincom. It's our kind of bootstrapping service even, I would say, which allows user to create a skeleton, a base, or even sometimes more complex feature of your Vadin application that you are going to develop. Uh, as you may know the start, you probably know the templates that are uh, available here to be picked and to be generated as, a, as your Vadin application. First of all, I will start by switching to the latest Vadin version. It will allow use to it will allow us to use the latest film editor feature on the next part of my presentation. What I'm going to show you is something that we're working working on currently, which is called the Visual View Builder. It's a low code tool that allows you to create your Vadin views in a very simple way by dragging and dropping the components to the canvas. The first step we are going to do is to choose a layout template. You can see the four, I think, most common popular templates with one to up to three column with a possibility to add header and footer. I will pick that one. Next, you see that we have some drop zones, some slots that are available. One of those are in that check mark background. Other are, others are white because those are empty layouts. When you pick a layout, uh, when you pick a component, you see its name. The main layout is vertical, so it's a column. Inside we have a horizontal, so row, and inside we have two more columns. So the components that are currently supported can be found on the left. Here is the components palette. I will try to create more or less realistic example of a view that you can build with the view builder. On the top, let's put some heading. As you can see, the drop zones are uh, highlighted in the light purple. The values of the dropped components like text and labels are default ones. Some of them can be changed, some of them not. I will show, I will show it in a minute. Uh, I've added a heading, so I'll put also some information, for example, about logged in user as myself. 
I've used the Avatar item component. The documentation about it, it's on the VAD index page. If I want to move the component to the right, I need to stretch the heading component because we are using flex layout here to align and stretch the components. And it moved right. Okay. Uh, by default in that template, the left column is a bit narrow. So let's expand it and put something inside. I want to create application where you have a grid preview of some list of items. And on the right, there will be a panel that will allow you to modify those items. Unfortunately, there won't be any deep logic involved into those components. They won't be linked that there aren't any workflows implemented because what you see is the beginning of our new tool. We are constantly working on it and improving the and adding new features. So in the list sections, we see a few versions of grid. So let's drop here a basic grid. As you may notice, it didn't take the full space because by default, vertical layout has inner padding. We should disable it. Okay, now it looks better. On the right side, I want to create some form that might in future become an editable part of the of the view, the place where you can update the entities. So let's put some smaller heading inside. Let's put some input fields. Uh, uh, I want to have those input fields align horizontally. There is no magic involved because we're inside vertical layout. If I started putting more components here, they will be just put one below each other, like in a normal column. So what should I do? I should add a horizontal layout inside. Now, everything I put in here will be placed in a row. So let's try it. Let's add the first uh, field. And I mentioned before that some of those example text can be modified. Uh, if you see an edit text means that that component is editable. Double clicking it or using the, the button allows you to edit the, the content. Let's call it, I don't know, customers because there are people below. Okay, so here I mentioned that I want to have a detail. So let's imagine that after clicking, the data is being loaded here. So we can have something like edit customer. Why not? Okay, the first field is the first name. Unfortunately, as I stated, there is no logic involved between those. So even if I click and select, it won't be auto-populated. Uh, let's add one more field and add another field. Uh, in current implementation, in current version, the layouting is based on the flex. And due to some growing and uh, shrinking options that we are working on, sometimes it might look weird that I need to disable stretching or, or enable it. But we are aware of that. We are working on that. Similar to the left panel, I'm removing the inner padding to make it look more or less equal. So let's do it more real, like last name. And email is OK. Uh, now, the horizontal layout took a whole space. So we need to shrink it uh, vertically. So after disable, disabling vertical stretching, you might notice that I have a lot of space below again. Uh, let's put one more example row of fields. Here is the horizontal layout. and. In that form, you might not notice, but on the right, there is also birth date and some occupation. So let's birth date be a date picker and occupation, let's be a select kind of real life. Date of birth, date of birth and occupation. Okay. One more time, I will disable uh, vertical stretching of the 
of that horizontal layout. Okay, below I wanted to have some table with some related data to give you a customer. I don't know, maybe some orders in the shop or some transaction history, let's call it transactions. Of course, it's only a text that I put here because when I put a grid, now I will, will pick the, for example, minimalist grid, the data is the same because we are using the same sample data provider. Okay, so the view starts to look more or less real. Now, when I'm in the addition mode, I cannot interact with the components. I cannot uh, show the dropdown of the, of the date picker or the select. I can just, yeah, edit them, remove them. The new feature that we added is the alignment. It's available from today. It's still under test, but yeah, it's something new that will be used, of course, in the future. Uh, after uh, getting our view ready, we can close the addition mode. And if you notice now, the components became uh, active as in normal application. They are for the moment uh, filled with some example data. We, in the future, we are working uh, on connecting the existing data providers. Uh, what can we do next with that application? And the very nice feature that we have implemented also is the sharing feature. The sharing feature is an ability to share your project between multiple users. There are two ways of sharing that application. The one is a write mode. We call it edit mode. You see the edit link. And the second one is a preview link. I will show I will I will share with you the preview link. You will get it in your email after the the, the webinar so you can open it and see how does it look uh, the view that I've created. If you open it, it should look like this. We have a preview of our application on the full screen. You can go back to the edition by using that bottom right link. Uh, the main difference is that when you perform changes on the preview link, they're not overriding the main application that I'm editing here. Only if you have that link, you can change it and I will see your changes also. Okay, so what's next? Let's download the application. It's being downloaded as a zip package inside which there is a Maven project. I will open it in my favorite IDE, which is IntelliJ. Give me a second. I will increase maybe the font size, but in general, the IDE changes are not so re relevant here. Okay. Two. Build the application, I just need to run Maven. It's default goal to run a, a Spring Boot application. Okay, and as you can see, I've got it up and running. Those two are default views that were all already on the start project, and that one is the view builder project that I've added. It was possible to change that name, of course, but yeah, I forget to do it. You can do it by changing the name here. Okay, what's next? I want to show you our next low code tool, which is hidden inside the DevTools. When you run your Vadin project in the development mode, you will see on the bottom right corner, our Vadin logo button, which are the Vadin DevTools. You'll see a bunch of useful features here. Also information about the used Vadin and Flow version, if we have live reload enabled, what feature flags are active, and the code locator that Mark mentioned before. I will focus on the theme editor. Uh, first, to start with the theme editor, we need to pick something that we want to style. Theme editor has a support of uh, most common HTML tags and 
most of the Vadin components. Styling of the Vadin components is a bit tricky because of the selectors of its complicated structure. You might know it from the docs that they're not always so simple, class name based selector or whatever. Let's start from something simple. I want to modify header. I've picked the header. It is bordered with that violet or purple border. What we can see in the theme editor is the class name because the theme editor is applying the class name. It is modifying your Java file and adding CSS role automatically. The class name is being constructed using a view and the component and some uh, incrementing value at the end. Okay, so for the header, let's change the, the color. Yeah, it become red magic. The film editor has two modes of working. The first one is local, which means that I'm styling only given instance of the component I've picked. And one is global, which means I'm styling all instances of the components uh, that are uh, in my application. Uh, at the end, I will show you the CSS uh, file, how, we, how, it is, how, how does it look? So for example, if I want to update all H3 headings, I've switched to global. And now let's add the border for them. Yeah, let's add some padding and probably background. I like adding backgrounds. Yeah, kind of small transparent background. And you may notice all the all the components have been updated. Uh, as for the Vadin components themselves, the structure of they may, might get very complicated. I think one of the most complicated is the grid itself. And grid has a lot of parts that can be styled. Currently, the theme editor allows modifying some of them. I think the most important ones. The, the things that we're doing almost all the time is distinguishing the odd and even rows. So let's change the background of odd and even rows. I don't know, maybe a bit yellowish. And as you might notice, both of them has been updated because I'm in the global mode. And I want that grid to have only the odd rows in slightly different color, yeah, something greenish. Okay, perfect. I love it. Uh, as for the inputs, they might look the same, but they are different components. So for example, if we focus on a text field and switch to global mode, we, are, we need to be aware that we are styling only the uh, text fields, not other components, because they are different uh, HTML tags. They require different uh, CSS selectors. So let's just quickly switch the color to the to the red, as I've noticed. As I've mentioned, those have been updated. The nice feature that we implemented recently that will be available in the 24.2 is a possibility to style the uh, overlays. <laughs> Unfortunately, my overlay is kind of overlaying the, the, the date picker, but but yeah, uh, let's pick the date picker and you see the special overlay options here, uh, which can be very tricky. It looks like a mess because the opacity, because of the opacity. Okay. The one great feature I want to mention about talking uh, about the film editor is a possibility to dynamically create the CSS selectors. I know that that can be painful because I was previously a developer in a company which was also responsible for filming. And it was not obvious to get to know which selector should I use to edit, for example, a month header or anything. So if I click the edit CSS button, my IDE pops out and the new, uh, empty at the beginning rule has been added. Uh, that one, month of calendar, month of header. If I change anything here, you might notice that 
due to Vita hot redeployment, uh, the updates have been applied automatically, both in the film editor and on the application itself. Uh, yeah, and if I have the file open, you know, see the cursor position is inside the bracket, so you don't have to search those by yourselves. Uh, how does film editor applies the class names? It, it's being done by checking your structure of your application. And there are cases that those class names cannot be applied. For example, if the uh, component is defined in line without any referencing variable, you will see a message that, hey, you might have to update your application to be accessible for film editor. But in our case, we see the class name has been applied. OK. Thank you very much. I'm giving my voice back to Mark. Yes, awesome. Cool demos. And let's see if I can find my slides again, just so we have something to look at. Uh, yeah. Uh, Actually, we have a few questions here. So march in if you want to join me, if you have some comments, uh, feel free. Uh, so I'm going to go through the questions here first. Uh, is it possible to reopen a, a UI later for further editing, or is Visual Builder more like a one-shot starter? And where is the metadata of the Visual Builder stored? It's a very good question, and I think the answer is, and you can fill in more details as you have them, but um, for the the kind of the thing you saw in startvadin.com now, the visual builder and so on, that's expanding on the startvadin.com thing. And you can't kind of, once you have downloaded the project, you currently can't kind of open it again. Uh, so for, like from your disk, you can't open it again. Uh, that's obviously something we are we want to work on, but right now that's how how it works. You can keep editing the kind of uh, the thing you have online. So in startvadin.com and startvadin.com is gaining kind of as you saw. There's a sharing feature uh, that saves the project and so on. And we are working on kind of getting getting more proper uh, so you can have multiple projects and so on going on. Uh, the other thing to mention is that these other tools you saw, uh, so the last one, the team editor, for instance, that's working on your local code. And obviously, as we keep working on these tools, we want as much as possible to be uh, to be kind of possible to do while you're developing as well. Uh, so we are working on that. Um, where is the metadata of the visual builder stored? I think... Marcin, am I right when I'm saying it's stored online on in kind of our, let's call it cloud, uh, and potentially in local storage? Okay, uh, during development, during working with the start, everything is stored in your local storage or session storage. So even if you reload the view, everything stays the same, you won't lose your, your progress. And for the first time, if you use your sharing feature, your application uh, model is being stored in a database on our private servers. That's how the feature, uh, that's how the sharing feature works. We are persisting the, the models uh, in a way that you can reopen it again in the future in two ways, in the addition mode, so like to continue working on that, or in the preview mode, just to share the link with the other people and allow them to continue work, but on their new generated application identifier. They won't overwrite the original changes. Yeah, so this is kind of, we have, uh, actually the next question is, do you plan to resign the designer plugin and so on? Uh, and yeah, we knew designer was going to come up because we didn't mention it. Uh, <laughs> and the answer is no, the designer is still alive and well, and we are supporting it. But yes, it's obvious that these tools have a little bit of overlap. 
but the kind of as you can see when we're talking about these they have we have started in kind of almost the opposite end to start building these tools uh, now and we're using kind of the knowledge from designer and pieces of it and so on uh, it's it's possible or kind of probable that the overlap will get more and more and maybe they will merge in the future or nothing is decided how that goes but but as you can see they kind of right now they address pretty different uh situations um yes let's see uh yeah so maybe talking about that so kind of starting starting at the opposite end kind of what we've done is started with the online experience and kind of enabling that enabling sharing enabling building kind of the, the navigation and so on uh, and and then kind of building these small tools that can also address specific uh, use case or kind of problems you have so the team editor for instance is kind of you could use that within the with the start button com experience but why not have it like we have it now so you can also edit files in your in your project and we'll kind of keep going down that path and and kind of adding things uh can we open an existing wadding pages and get the same view so you can't kind of open uh files that you have on your machine and it's not that that would be super difficult to open but kind of with designer we have seen that it's difficult to uh, not break things when you are when you're free to edit anything by hand so we're kind of working on how how these all tools should fit together and so on um yes do we have anything else to add here uh, there are some links here. Uh, oh, one more question here. Uh, as of now, Visual Builder is free to use. Are you planning to make the Visual Builder a license tool or will it stay free? <clears throat> Very good question that I forgot to address. Uh, we haven't decided specifics, but it's very likely that uh much of it will stay free and free to use uh but some specific things we might uh make commercial or maybe some usage limits how much you can save online in the tool and so on but there are no kind of plans of that and kind of the basic functionality i can almost promise that will not go away or kind of get um commercial so uh, yeah, we'll include some links here where you can kind of see some documentation and where you get to try these tools. Uh, that will show up within a day or so, the whole slides and the recording of this. Uh, I think we'll include a link to kind of the prototype that Marchin built live, mm -hmm. so you can kind of poke around. Um, and. Uh, and also, I want to remind again that we have some, I hinted at some some experiments we're doing and so on. Uh, come to Wadding Create. I think we will have some really interesting things to show uh, around these topics there. Uh, let's see, we have some more questions coming in here. So we have a few minutes uh, still. Uh, Um, yes, so a database parameter, is it only for driver Maven settings? Do you, Marcin, have, a, have an answer for that? I, th yes. yeah, I, I yes. think yes. Ba basically, yes. yes. So I think I shortly mentioned it. There is kind of a, we have for a long time had a data uh, kind of data model editor that were, have, has worked with some views. It's been very hidden and limited. Uh, you can kind of, uh, in the settings, you can decide which database you want when you download the project. 
uh, the whole data source kind of feature is something we are planning to expand on. But currently it's, it's yeah, it's for kind of, um, uh, kind of in your project configuring what you want to use. Uh, so, but yes, you are, you have interesting questions about, or kind of ideas about using local or cloud databases and, and kind of, will it be possible to uh, create RAD operations on the table? So, so it's not kind of the next thing on the roadmap, I think, but, but we do have some ideas and plans to expand I, on that. I will yeah. add one small comment on that question about connect to uh, connect the tool to the existing database. Uh, in, at the moment, it's not possible. We are thinking about having something that will allow you to plug in some external data sources. But the good point is that the structure of generated application is using the services and data providers approach mostly. And if you want to switch your, for example, grid data, it should be without any problems because we are using the standard approaches like Spring Auto Wiring with the, with the service that is providing the data with the repositories and so on. So yeah, it's based on Spring. So if you are familiar with Spring, it should be very easy to just replace the data source and have your own data in the, in the tables. Yeah, that's a, a really good point. I've actually myself, just for demo purposes, but kind of downloaded, made a starter to get the views I want and then uh, downloaded it and switched it to use some ready uh, data I have, which is quite convenient. Okay, but I think that's all for today. So I hope to see you all at Vardin Create, if not before that. And have a nice rest of the day. Thank you. Bye-bye.